and welcome to this review of my Razer Huntsman mini keyboards. I've previously reviewed the Tournament Edition Huntsman, which was a TKL with the standard linear Libra optoelectric switches, and upon my request, Razer sent me a clicky keyboard too, along with a Mercury Edition white one that uses a dampened version of their linear switch. If you're curious as to how the switches work, I recently did a teardown video where I show this in detail. Now in my Huntsman TE review, which you may find informative as well by the way, I came to the conclusion that the board was very light but fairly well built, quite well kitted out and that the switches were extraordinarily smooth, but it was let down by two things. First of all, it used Synapse, which is Razer's controlling software, and more importantly, its actuation point was so high up at just one millimeter that coupled with a very light weighting of just 40 grams, the switches went off at practically the merest touch, so it would constantly be registering unwanted key presses just from the weight of your fingers. So the most visually obvious difference is that these mini keyboards use a 60% form factor, whereas the TE is a TKL. Now, in my personal opinion, this is worse. I hate having to use a layer key to access something as basic as arrow keys and F keys, but I'm aware that there are a lot of people who really like 60% keyboards. I mean, just look at the MK Reddit front page at, <laughs> well, any given moment. And Razer apparently noticed this too, hence why they brought out this model. But that's fine, form factors are very much a matter of taste anyway, something different for everyone. The keycaps are the exact same as on the other Huntsman. They're double shot PBT, so very durable indeed, although some of them don't let the light through evenly, which results in this blotched lettering, which is an issue I found with a lot of double shot backlit keycaps. Compared to the moronic try-hard gamery look of their earlier models, both the keycaps and in fact the entire keyboard is a big improvement because those older Razer models look positively hideous. Particularly the availability of a white, so-called Mercury model, seems rather unrazor like But it exists. Even the box art is less aggressive. Maybe Razer are trying to appeal to the Apple crowd with its white look. The Mercury model also comes with grey coloured parts, including the switches, but this is just a cosmetic difference. The boards weigh just under 450 grams each sans cable. The case is made out of rather thin plastic, and the plate is made out of aluminium, so I guess that makes sense. I'd say the plastic is rather flimsy, but the metal plate holds everything together well enough. Also, no hidden screws, which is always a good thing. The switches are quite different and well worth elaborating upon. Let's start with the dampened linears. Sound-wise, it's definitely a lot quieter than the original linears. Let me show you that real quick. So the majority of the clack has been removed, ergo the dampening appears to be quite effective. I'll quickly compare it to Cherry MX silent switches as well, although this is really not a valid comparison, because this Leopold has a silenced chassis as well as silent switches, but it also uses way taller keycaps, and the two chassis have quite different acoustics anyway, so keep that in mind, but just as a really rough indication. So, kind of same order of magnitude of noise, I guess. Can't say much more than that. Under these circumstances, they're pretty similar. So, how does a dampening effect key travel? Well, it doesn't really feel noticeably short, and neither is it too mushy, so that's good. Now, to clarify, dampening a switch with rubbers inherently brings with it a degree of mushiness. That's kind of the whole point of sound dampening. The question is just how much. And in this case, I'd say it's pretty decent. It doesn't bottom out quite as rock hard as the original, but frankly, some might see that as an advantage. It's not too mushy, though. Again, comparing them to MX silent switches, I'd say that the bottoming out feeling is roughly the same. It feels like an obviously dampened switch, I mean, you can instantly tell that, but it's not as mushy as a rubber dome keyboard. The Libra switches are considerably smoother than the MX ones, though. But now for the biggest surprise, I went into these fully expecting them to be just as hyperactive as their non-dampened counterparts, but they're not. They still fire unintentionally on occasion, but it's nowhere near as bad as on the TE, and this genuinely confused me as the key travel specs are the same. I even went back to the old TE model to see if I hadn't changed my typing style or something in the meantime, which can happen by the way, but no, the TE still fired like crazy. 
So I wanted to check this out and I asked Razor to measure some actual force curves for me. You know, those marketing ones are always a bit simplified. And indeed, it seems I was right. The original ones were measured at 37 grams and the new ones at 45. So yeah, something does appear to have changed and for the better, most definitely. Now for the clicky ones, I didn't get any random key presses at all, but that shouldn't be surprising because it has a slightly stiffer weighting and deeper actuation point, as well as being behind a tactile bump, all of which help a lot with issues like this. It's still pretty light for a clicky switch, but I'd say this weighting and travel make a lot more sense than the ultra light weighting of the linears. Now the big question is of course, how does it compare to MX type clicky switches? You know, click jacket versus click bolt, let's do this. And on another razor no less, let's use an old Black Widow for comparison, that fuck ugly minger I showed earlier. Now, like I said in the teardown, one of the main reasons they used a click bolt rather than a click jacket was to keep the key travel smooth. But to be honest, I never considered smoothness to be a problem in MX Blue. The jacket is free floating much of the time anyway, so it's not too bad really. However, the Libras are considerably smoother and nicer during the actual tactile event. And although the tactility is neither stronger nor sharper, if anything it feels slightly weaker, the added smoothness really helps, it makes a much bigger difference than I thought it would originally. The sound is predictably quite different, having a different clicker and all. Compared to MX Blue, the sound of just the clicker alone is slightly higher pitched. But unlike MX Blue, it doesn't rattle, it's a more precise, defined sound. A bit like click bars, except unlike click bars, they don't make a sound on the upstroke as well. Click bar switches double click. The sound of the clack is a lot bassier than MX Blue though, and the switch overall doesn't sound as plasticky or as crunchy, I'd say. Yeah, I definitely say that sound-wise it's a big improvement, it's surprisingly meaty. I mean, not Blue Alps meaty, of course. But for a modern switch, it's pretty good. I mentioned click bars just now, and those are what I'd put them closer to. In fact, they feel a little bit like box white switches, except lighter. The sound of the clicker itself is slightly higher pitched than click bars, and volume-wise it's kind of between that of thin and thick click bars. The jade ones are louder, whereas the white ones are softer. Here's what they sound like compared to some box jade switches in my IGK61. Now, some of you may be thinking that these switches were made by Bloody, who also use optoelectric switches that look exactly the same, and you're almost right on that count. They weren't made by Bloody, but the company that makes them, Dongguan Mingjiang Electronic Technology, or DMET, OEMs these switches for both companies, presumably under slightly different specifications. They call them MJ3.0, Bloody call them Light Strike Libra, Razer just call them Razer Optical Switch, which isn't very imaginative to be honest, so I just keep calling them Light Strike Libra. Now, so far it's pretty good, I'd say. The switches are exceptionally smooth and, very importantly, not as hyperactive as they were before. I can't overstate how important that is, by the way. The sound is pretty good, build quality is good enough, keycaps are double shot PBT, which is excellent, so yeah, certainly not bad so far, I'd say. But now we come to the big fat negative, the software, Synapse. And oh boy, have I got news for you. So when I did the unboxing and I mentioned that their software, Synapse, was pretty much legendarily shit, some people in the comments mentioned that they found it to be pretty nice, so I thought, well, good, maybe they changed it recently. And yes, they did. And as a result, it's now worse than ever. Let me just show you what happens when I plug in one of the hunts, any of the three huntsmen. So I'm greeted with this install screen to install Synapse, but wait, what's this? Alexa? 
as an Amazon Alexa? What the fuck is Alexa doing in my keyboard? What is this? I don't even have an Alexa. And it's installing it by default. And there's all this other rubbish here. Chroma Connect, Chroma Studio, Chroma Viz, and Hue? What the fuck is Hue? Philips Bridge, what? And <laughs> Macro, you can install signups without the macros. Why on earth would you do that? I thought the whole point of signups was that you can finally use your keyboard with macros the way it was meant to be. And nano -ly light panels? Why is all this shit? And what's this here? Razer Cortex? Best prices? Oh, that's the corporate bullshit. Well, at least I have the decency to leave that one off by default. Oh, and by the way, I get this installer every time I plug in a Razer keyboard now, presumably until I give in and install all this crap. See, when I stumble into shit like this, I don't even want to install anything anymore. Look at this, it wants to download over 400 meg and what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight programs. Well, get this shit away from me, man. I'm not playing this game. You can fuck right off. So I'm not even going to report on the macro function either, because as the manual states, Synapse needs to be installed and fucking running as well. Here, here, see this thing here? This is a Focus 20 key mechanical macro pad from 1990 something. Know how much software I need to program anything into it? None. Know how many things it prompts me to install when I plug it in? None. Know how much corporate crap it throws at me when I try to use it? None. I mean, this is a nice keyboard and all, but when I see shit like this, I just want to throw it out of a window. I shouldn't need to download or install anything if I just want to use my keyboard. Why is the macro function locked behind a wall of corporate dog shit? Why can't I just use the keyboard to its full potential without installing the extra toolbars and browser features and something or whatever security tool? It just feels like it's one of those installers that tries to trick you into installing all kinds of stuff you didn't ask for. I mean, what am I, one of those elderly ladies that falls for that? Next thing they want me to send my bank account details to some Nigerian email address before I can use the RGB. No thanks. So here's today's lesson. If any keyboard asks you to install a fucking several hundred megabyte configuring program, this is what you're actually downloading. Fucking Alexa in your keyboard and fucking Philips light panels and shit. That's what you're saying yes to. And next time, they might not even ask us. They'll just install it all. Shenanigans, I tell you. So what do I think of them? Well, I pretty much said it already, they're really nice keyboards if you don't count the software. I'd have liked a full size personally, but for anyone who's into 60%, these would be a good choice, I'd say. The switches are exceptionally smooth and sound good, and they're pretty well kitted out. The price is okay considering what you get for it, $130 for the 60% compared to $150 for the TKL, which is just kind of standard premium keyboard price territory. Not cheap, but certainly not wallet-breakingly bad, and it's got the stuff to back it up. For the linear models, I still think that an analog version, preferably in full size, would be better because you do still occasionally get accidental key presses on the linear model, but this would be paired with a much higher price tag, I'm sure, and that might not be worth it for everyone. That'd be more of a true enthusiast model for crazy people like me who pay hundreds of dollars for a keyboard. Besides, these new dampened models, like I said, are a definite improvement on the older ones considering they have much fewer accidental triggerings. Anyway, that's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on both of these keyboards.